Let's bring our minds back to, actually, it might have been the first or the second lesson within three-dimensional vectors, which is kind of convenient because we're actually pretty much at the end of three-dimensional vectors. You're like, wow, did we already get there? Um, yes, we did. So we were looking at the three-dimensional coordinate space, right? And one of the things we looked at was like, oh, how do you represent points? How do you look at them? And then one of the first things that we then said was, actually in three dimensions, there are some objects which we can think about as being very, very similar to objects that we already know. This is the equation, the Cartesian equation of the unit circle, right? But all you need to do, as we saw many times going from 2D to 3D, all you need to do to turn a circle into a sphere is... Okay. Add a z squared, right? You're like, woohoo, I've got a unit sphere, I guess. Now, we left it there. We didn't really touch it at all, actually, because then we had to say, well, that's kind of nice. We get that out of Pythagoras, right? Um, because, in fact, that's a 1 squared. Um, if it were a sphere of radius 2, it wouldn't be 2 over there. It'd be 2 squared, right? Um, but then we kind of left it behind because we had to get our head back into just vector stuff and all the geometric reasoning we could do with that. But now, we're kind of trying to come full circle. <laughs> yeah, sorry, okay, it was bad. Um, we're returning back to this idea because spheres are really interesting. We can do lots of interesting things with them. This, as you recall, this is the Cartesian equation of a sphere. But in the last few lessons, we have been exploring the fact that in three dimensions, it is often very useful to represent things with a vector equation. Now, Think back with me, right? Uh, we went from 2D circles to 3D spheres in the Cartesian way, and it wasn't too difficult, okay? You may need to go back to your previous notes on this, but can anyone remind me what is the vector equation of a circle? What's the vector equation of a circle? Go ahead, Edgar. Uh, absolute value of r minus, minus whatever vector you have. Yep, so let's call it c for center, right? And then what have I got over here? A radius squared, right? So um, this could be anything. I, I've used r over here, which is, which is fine. I'm actually just going to, for the sake of reducing ambiguity, right? Uh, I'm going to put a radius squared, yeah. Oh yeah, no, you're quite right. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting Cartesian equation confused. All right, now, um, you may recall from the complex plane, this is exactly what we saw with saying, say, the modulus of z take away whatever reference point is the circle, uh, is the center of your circle. Yes? We like this because it is, even though the equation, the Cartesian equation of a circle isn't too bad, this is better. Do you agree? Now, let's think about this. What about if you had a sphere? How would this be different? How would the extension from two dimensions into three change this equation? Well, let's think about it. Um, what is the definition of a sphere? What is the definition of a sphere? Actually, no, I should rewind. What's the definition of a circle? I mean, dealing with circles and then using that to extend the spheres. If someone said to you, like, rather than saying, oh, it's a round thing, can we actually, we're in extension two now, we can give a proper technical definition for what a circle is. Anyone want to have a go? Morgan? A circle, you start with a point, right? You start with a point, and then you've got a constant radius. That's true, however, we're using the specialized language of circles. If someone didn't know what a circle was and you said that to them, they'd be like, well, what does that mean? Okay, so we're talking about distance, right? There's a constant distance from that point to. Well, a whole bunch of points, right? We might say back in complex numbers, a subset of the complex plane, because there's infinitely many of them. Okay. Can you take that very good definition, Morgan, and extend that into spheres? Probably the same thing. Yeah, that's right. In the definition you just gave me, you didn't say it, but you actually implied that we're in two dimensions, right? But if we just take that same definition, there's some central point, and then I want that subset of points that are all the same distance from that, does that not also equally describe a sphere? So, get this, right? Uh, I wonder if this rings any bells from when we say did the 3D dot product of um, two vectors, right? For a sphere, here is the equation in three dimensions. You're like, oh, if it has the same geometric de definition, it will have the same 
equation. Um, there is one teeny difference though. Um, what would be the difference to get us from 2D to 3D? It's kind of like tucked in, the way, in there, kind of hidden, right? Say again. Yeah, there will be this extra z, just like we had in the Cartesian equation, right? It's just that the vector equation, part of its point, part of its point is it's succinct. All of that is kind of like hidden inside R. Make sense? OK, so now we're ready to have a look at a question like this. Um, if you came a bit later, then maybe jot down a few of these details with me. We've got two spheres. And you can see the equations of those spheres. Have a look with me. You've got R minus, and then you've got this center point described by that vector. There's the first sphere. And it's got a radius of 7. Second sphere, different center, different radius. What we want to do is show that the spheres touch each other at a single point. Now I want you to ponder this for a moment. A few of you arrived early enough that you've been looking at this question and had it kicking around in the back of your brain. But others, this is the first time you've seen it. I'm not worried about the answer so much. I mean, in some ways, it's just a proof. So it's like, it does, <laughs> or they do rather. We're going to get to the method in a second, but I want you to think about how might you geometrically reason this. I'll give you a clue for a start. We've been doing all that thinking about spheres so far by attaching it to something that we know pretty well. Circles, right? I'm going to encourage you to draw a diagram or a few on your page and see if you can work out what might be some calculations that we can do that can help us prove that these two spheres do indeed intersect at just a single point. Give you a bit of thinking time, and we'll come back together. And we might just get pens out of hands for a brief moment. I promise you'll have enough time to continue thinking about this, because there won't be that much board work, so it's not like I'm going to rub it off, and you're going to need to like madly catch up. So just pens down and look up briefly. Let's think about this question for a minute, because I feel like you actually learn just as much from the methods that don't work on this question than from the methods that do. So think about what the question is asking, and what might be a normal way to go about this. You have two things. And apparently, they should intersect at exactly one place. Now, when you are usually searching for points of intersection, like in the past, we've only ever searched for points of intersection in a Cartesian world. So if you get given two objects, right, presumably their equations, how would you normally find the points of intersection between two things? You would equate, equate them, solve simultaneously in some kind of way. Okay. Now, just have a look at this for a moment. You immediately run into a problem, whether you go a vector path or a Cartesian path. I'll do it the Cartesian way just because I think it will be more obvious to you why this is problematic. What would be the Cartesian equation that corresponds to this vector equation? Let me give you a clue. It's going to have some of these. Anyone want to start me off? Jeff? Um, x minus 5 squared x minus 5 squared. Y, y plus 6 squared. Y plus 6 squared. Plus 3 minus 3 squared. OK, but before you go on, let's just pause. Where did you get all of this? This vector here, this is the c vector. It's the center of our sphere, right? And we know we can go from a sphere like this, which has a center where? on the origin, right? And all we need to do is just do a series of translations in a horizontal, vertical, uh, up, down, no, no, whatever, an x and y and a z direction, right? And that will get you to a new center, like the one you want, right? And then you would say, because we would get Pythagoras out of this, we actually get a Pythagorean quadruple. Do you remember that? What's going to be on the end here? 49, 7 squared. Fantastic. Okay. Now, when you come down to this, just for the sake of illustration, you can actually read this off for me, can't you? It's going to start with an x and then plus 3 y minus 2, z minus 7, and 25. That's the 5 squared. OK, now just have a look at this. Imagine you're thinking, OK, I have two Cartesian equations. I know how to find points of intersection. I'm going to solve simultaneously. I don't even want to begin, right? Because you've got two equations and how many variables? Three. No fun. Don't even start. Okay. We know enough to know where there's going to be a dead end in the future, even before beginning. Okay. Not that it would be wrong. You will just not get something useful out of this. And you could do the equivalent process for vector equations, right? You could try and do some interaction here. You will still end up with an x and a y and a z, and not enough information to solve them. Make sense? 
So how else can we go about this? Uh, Varane, can you talk us through, even though you didn't originally come up with like a formal way to say this, can you talk us through your way of doing this? And just before you listen to Varane's solution, I want to tell you why I went here first, because it is so exceptionally lazy that mathematicians would say, ah, a man after my own heart. Okay, do you want to tell us what you did? So, nice and loud. I found the distance between the two center points from the spheres. Just hold up there. Hey, Angad, make sure you catch this, right? Start again, Varan. Thank you. I found the distance between the two center points on the spheres. Okay, so I'm going to put a center here and a center here for my two spheres. And I've, I've just drawn them as if they're touching because I've been told so. What was that distance? Um, 12. 12. So here is that distance 12. Yes? You found that distance by what method? Um, no, no, no. I just think about it for a second. I just added, I mean, I found A, B, I guess, where the center is. Five, <laughs> seven. But you could also say, I know the coordinates of, yeah, I guess we could call this A and call this B. Right? And that gives me a, I just have to use the distance. So I can just use vector, vector magnitudes, right? And you find 12. So then, what's your next step of logic? I added the two radii, and if they were equal to the distance I just found, then it touches at one point. What do you think of that line of argument? It is, as I said before, exceptionally lazy in exactly the kind of way that mathematicians love. I did need these two coordinates, right, in order to work out uh, that actual distance AB, because before you know those, you're sort of guessing at this, right? Except for the question telling you, right? So you go ahead and do that distance. It is 12, 5 plus 7, one single point of intersection. Quite nice, right? So the method that I just demonstrated works pretty well and very elegantly for the question as stated. And to be fair, you know, the question as stated is very simple. Just show that the spheres touch each other at a single point. But if we want to go further, if the question asks something more sophisticated, like say for example, can you find that single point? We're going to need to be a little more uh, judicious in our use of our vector geometry and reasoning. And it's not that hard. So I want to show you how we can actually go a little bit further than what this question asks to get a little bit more detail. If we just go back to our diagram here, we've got a uh, circle with center A, uh, or rather I should say sphere with center A and sphere with center B, set up like so, just like you saw on the board. And if I want to find out what is that point of intersection right there, I'm going to call it P, then I can use some fairly sim simple scalar multiples of the vectors involved here to find out where P is on the basis of these two radii here, 5 and 7, which are known from me reading that in the question off of these vector equations for spheres. For example, um, you can see that I can think of P as some way along this interval from A to B, which is another way of saying it's kind of a scalar multiple of the vector A B. It's just what is the appropriate multiple. So what I want to do first is work out what this vector AB is. If I write down AB is equal to, and I just need to compare my X and my Y and my Z components to see what kind of change happens in each of these orthogonal directions. So for instance, if I just compare the X's, here's negative 3 and 5. What's the change that gets me from negative 3 up to 5? It's going to be 8. What about uh, 2 to negative 6? Well, it's also 8, but in the opposite direction. So I'm going to write that as negative 8. And then my z from 7 down to 3, that's going to be negative 4. So once I've positioned AB in this way, how far along AB do I need to go to get to this point here, P? And the answer is, if this whole length here is 12, then I need to go 5 twelfths of the way along vector AB, and that should land me right at P. So how does your arithmetic actually play out? Well, you can see here what I've done is I've set up, let's start from uh, point A right here, negative 3, 2, 7. Uh, there I am, and I'm going to go 5 twelfths of the way along this vector that I've just written down, 8, negative 8, negative 4. So from here, it's really just crunching the numbers. It's just a bit of arithmetic, but there are some things you can do to make this a bit easier for yourself. For example, in this first line here, I should say second after setting it up, you can see that what I've done is this first uh, vector, or point A rather, um, the vector to point A uh, is unchanged, but what I've done on the right hand side is I've noticed I've got a common factor of a quarter 
and that can cancel with this four that is a, a common multiple or a common factor in through here. So you can see what I've done is I've divided everything through here by four and I've multiplied the coefficient or the scalar multiple by four. So it's all balanced out. Once I've got that, you can see what I've done next is I've combined these two into one. And even though all of this is nice and neat and whole numbers, um, it's going to have to interact with things in thirds. So I've gotten everything with a common denominator. Thirds, 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 off we go. And from there, this is the point that I find. Now when you have a look, you do a quick sense check, you think, yeah, a third, that's going to be between this negative and this positive. It's going to be closer to this negative one, and that makes sense because point P is five twelfths along the way. You can check all of these, and what's great about this is, I sort of arbitrarily chose to go from this smaller sphere towards the larger sphere. There's no reason why I couldn't go in the opposite direction. I can just check if I get the same thing. So for instance, here I've got the circles, or the spheres rather, set up backwards. I'm gonna start from the bigger sphere, which I had as center B, and move toward the smaller sphere. Well, two things are gonna change in this scenario. Number one, instead of vector AB, I'm gonna be dealing with vector B a, so you can see all of my signs here are backwards to what I had before. Negative 8, 8, 4, as opposed to 8, negative 8, negative 4. So that's backwards. And then the second thing is, in order to get to this point P, which I've not actually labeled on this particular diagram, instead of going uh, 5 twelfths of the way from here, from A, I'm going to go 7 twelfths of the way from B. So that's why you can see my start point is different, B, my scalar multiple of the vector is different, then I'm going to go from B to A, and then this is vector BA right here. But as you have a look at the numbers, everything does check out. I get the same coordinates for B as, as you'd really hope. Just lastly, we looked earlier on right at the start of this, we got these uh, Cartesian equations here for our two spheres. We got them, but we determined that in terms of solving this question, they weren't particularly useful. However, now that we've already solved the question, we can actually use the Cartesian equations quite conveniently to confirm, as we've already done a couple of different ways, that our answer is correct. If my answer is correct, and this point P is the common intersection point, then I should be able to put this point into either of these vector equations, or Cartesian equations, I should say, and they should satisfy, right? Because to be on the surface of the sphere, um, the points x, y, and z, or those coordinates, should satisfy these equations. So if you go ahead and do that, you can see I've highlighted this in green, just so I can make it more obvious. Here's me substituting into the first sphere. There's the three x, y, and z coordinates. You get a radius of 40, sorry, you get a radius squared of 49, as you'd expect. And then when you do it in the second sphere, same thing pans out you get a radius of 5 squared uh, over here, as you would expect from the Cartesian equation. So, moral of story is, think carefully about how your geometry fits together, and then use your vector equations in the most simple way you can. Like what you've got here, the arithmetic is not complicated. It's really the geometric thinking and the setup that really is where all your, um, I would say, your attention and your effort is going to be focused.